Um, today's colloquium speaker is uh, Joan Najita from NOAO, and she is here at CFA spending a year on sabbatical uh, at, with the ITC. Now, Joan is no stranger to uh, Cambridge or the CFA because uh, back many years ago, uh, she came from Hawaii to Cambridge to attend uh, Harvard and Radcliffe. And um, she got a degree here in uh, 1985, right? And uh, she was quite an outstanding student. She graduated summa cum laude. She got various academic prizes. Uh, you know, really had a brilliant um, a resume. And I can tell you I know that because I got to see it. Because I first met Joan that year when she came to the University of Arizona, and I was the graduate program chair, and all prospective students who came to uh, U of A would come and see me, and I'm supposed to give them a pep talk and convince them to uh, come to the U of A. And Joan came, and I looked at this resume, and said, wow, this is really a gifted person, really brilliant person. And that was even confirmed to the utmost for me when I read down in her uh, research plan that she wanted to do star formation. And I was totally convinced <laughs> that I had to put a full court press on Joan to get her to attend and come to the U of A for graduate school. But uh, unfortunately, she turned us down. And she went up to, uh, after uh, taking a year off and living in Japan, she went to Berkeley up on the West Coast and worked with that guy, Frank Shu. Um, <laughs> Which is, I think, okay, because she wanted to do theory, and you know, Frank was a preeminent theorist in star formation, and I think it all turned out uh, pretty well. Um, I also, though, uh, have to say that it wasn't a total loss, because I did, in fact, get to teach Joan. She took uh, my graduate course in uh, star formation and interstellar medium, at least an accelerated version of it, at the 1988 Vat Vatican Summer School, where both she and David Wilner were classmates. So. Uh, I've known Joan for quite some time. Um, and then she came here on a postdoc after her uh, time at Berkeley, and it was about 1994, I think, uh, where she came as a CFA fellow, uh, spent uh, three years here, went on to Space Telescope on another postdoc, and then uh, NOAO, where she now is on, on the staff. Um, when Joan was at Berkeley, like I said, she did star formation research, and she worked on a really hard problem uh, while she was there with Frank. She helped develop with Frank and I think um, Susanna and others the X-wind theory for um, bipolar outflows, uh, disk-driven magneto centrifugal winds that uh, would power these things. So she's, uh, you know, has really accomplished in uh, disk theory. And after that, she continued her interest in disk when she came here and then uh, later at NOAO. And she did some very, um, very nice pioneering work where, uh, with John Carr, they were one of the first people to actually look at spectral lines being emitted inside circumstellar disks. <coughs> and they did some very nice things with the CO rho vibrational transitions, where they were able to model the band heads using the rotation curves of disk and actually confirm that these things are really disk, especially around intermediate mass stars, which hadn't been uh, uh, done before. And also, she began to uh, infer, you know, the physical properties of the material in the disk from using the spectroscopy. So she's been a big pioneer in that and has continued that work uh, over the last many years at NOAO. And I think we'll hear uh, her latest on uh, those endeavors in this colloquium. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Joan uh, uh, Najita here to the CFA and hopefully uh, uh, we'll all see much of her during the next uh, 12 months or so. Joan? Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for that very extremely kind uh, introduction, and um, uh, and uh, thanks to uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. It's a real honor, um, and a special thanks to Avi and the ITC for their generous hospitality and uh, kind support of my sabbatical visit. Um, you know, as Charlie mentioned, um, I've been here before, and it's really great to be back in the uh, exciting intellectual environment of the. CFA, and um, you know, whenever you return someplace that you've been before, it's uh, whether it's 16 days after government shutdown or a longer period. In my case, um, 
it's always a good opportunity for reflection. And so as I was walking around to all the old places, I was thinking, wow, you know, just how much the world has changed um, since all the other times that I've been here. And uh, so when I was an undergraduate, the world was perhaps a simpler, lonelier place. You know, the, the only planets that we knew of were the ones in our solar system, and there were still nine of them. Um, <laughs> but when I returned as a postdoc, we just got in the exciting news that the solar system's not alone, that there are extrasolar planets out there, and we knew of so few that we could put each one on its own black bar on these view graphs. And the data rate was slow enough that we could contemplate each one in loving detail while we waited for the next news report. Well, fast forward to today, and it's it's a to this totally different situation. We know of so many thousands of extrasolar planets that we can't possibly put them on their own black bars, but instead people can make these wonderful bar charts that tell us the incidence rate of planets, and not just overall, but as a function of mass. And what an amazing range of masses <coughs> from giant planets like Jupiter down to Earth-sized planets, with the amazing conclusion that Practically all sun-like stars are surrounded by planets. So it seems like the situation is completely the opposite. We've gone from a situation where the solar system was perhaps a lonely only child to a situation where it's one of a cast of thousands. But you know, um, there's an old saying that as much as things change, they also stay the same. And that's a little bit tr true here too in the sense that some of the questions that have been raised by the discovery of all these extrasolar planets are some of the same ones that we've always had. And what simple questions they are. How do planets form? When and where do planets form? And how do they get their masses? Of course, these questions, there are some tentative answers to all these questions. Theorists haven't been idle. Um, and so it's partly the um, job, I guess, of people who study planet formation to um, try to figure out how much of these answers are true by looking for clues uh, to these kinds of questions by detecting and studying planet formation as it occurs. So what is this picture that we're trying to test? Well, it's the familiar story of core accretion. And just to give a quick review of that. Uh, the story goes like this. The story of planet formations through core accretion starts in molecular clouds, where they, which are clumpy and they have some angular momentum. So when the material collapses, it makes a circumstellar disk, which is filled with gas and dust. And the material in the dust, the material in the disk um, swirls around from the outer disk to the inner disk, eventually hoping to accrete on the onto the central star. But while, that, while it's spiraling in, a magical transformation can occur. <laughs> so the, the solids in the disk, the micron-sized dust, gradually settles and hits other grains and sticks and grows eventually into meter-sized objects, which collide and grow, eventually making kilometer-sized planetesimals, which collide and grow, eventually making Mars-sized protoplanets. And if they collide and grow fast enough to make a 5 to 10 Earth mass core at a time when the disk still has a lot of gas around, then it can accrete a gaseous envelope and make a giant planet. Otherwise, we end up with a terrestrial planet. Soon after, after the material that didn't go into making the star and the planets is swept away, we end up with a finished uh, planetary system. Ta-da! So that's a great story. And we really like it. We've always really liked it. Um, one of the reasons is because it provides a good way to understand why, the, why there are terrestrial and giant planets in our solar system. This picture also provides a good way to understand why there are terrestrial and sized and giant planets around other stars. And because this picture puts a special, gives a special role for the solids in the disk, they're, they get the whole process going. The more solids you have, the faster the process will grow and the more successful you will be. This kind of a picture gives a natural way to understand why giant planets are more prevalent 
around stars with higher metallicities. <coughs> so there are many ways, there are many reasons why this is an attractive picture, but perhaps you could see from my story that there are a couple of things that we should try to check out in this picture to make sure that it's true. And so two of the topics, so I want to talk about two topics today. Um, the first, one about a very early phase of planet formation, planetesimal formation, and one about a later phase. So in planetesimal formation, um, as you can kind of see from the core accretion picture, planetesimals are kind of like the hallmark of core accretion. They're really important to make the, how the process works. The solids are important in getting core accretion going. So these are the supposed building blocks of planets in core accretion, yet we really don't know anything about them. We don't know very much about that phase of evolution. So let's see if we can get a few insights in that. Then I wanted to talk about how we might be able to um, study giant planet formation as it occurs, because if we can detect giant planets as they're forming, that gives us a pretty direct information about how they form and some of their properties, like how they get, what, how big are they to start, and how do they get their masses. So as Charlie mentioned, I love to study the gas in disks, so I wanted to um, use that as a tool to address these kinds of questions. Um, and so here's a little diagram of some of the diagnostics that we have to study gaseous disks, uh, looking at what radii they probe as a function of distance from the star. So going from like a tenth of an AU to one AU to 10 AU. So when I was a postdoc, um, the, uh, this diagram was very sad, uh, for me anyway. Uh, the, we could probe the disk at large radii using a wonderful diagnostics in the millimeter. And we had just discovered diagnostics that could probe uh, the disk at very small radii using simple molecules like CO and OH. But the main region, main part of the planet formation region was basically unprobed. We didn't have diagnostics of that region. So luckily, in the meantime, we've been able to locate some diagnostics that can do that job um, through use of the wonderful Spitzer Space Telescope. So I want to illustrate a couple things that we can do with those data and then go on to um, point out some new insights that we can get from studying some of these old diagnostics. So when Spitzer looks at a young star with a planet, potentially planet-forming disk, this is what it looks like. So here we have flux density plotted as a function of wavelength going from 10 microns to 35 microns. And uh, this little blip down here is the long wavelength end of the silicate emission. And you can see that the mid-infrared spectrum of T Tauri stars, of disks, are uh, extremely rich in molecules. So most of these features are water. The ones that are marked by diamonds are OH, and there are other OH lines that extend into the short wavelength region. And over here in the 13 to 15 micron region are vibrational bands of simple organics like acetylene and HCN, and also carbon dioxide. So with this little uh, suite of molecules, we can still address a couple of interesting questions. Oh, first let me mention that the uh, region of the disk that these radii, that these diagnostics probe is uh, basically the terrestrial planet region of the disk. There's several lines of argument, but here's a pretty simple one. If we take a Spitzer spectrum, <coughs> we find an object that's pretty bright so we can observe it from the ground, and we, spe we spectrally resolve its emission. Uh, it has this sort of double peak shape, and the radii that that corresponds to for this system with known inclination is a range of about 0.3 to 1 AU. So it's probing the terrestrial planet region of the disk. Okay. So what kinds, of, um, what kinds of questions can we answer with that simple suite of molecules? So one, one question that we looked at early on was the, just the general question of whether, whether disks are doing anything chemically or not. Uh, the question here is when um, material, when disks, do disks just inherit stuff from the interstellar medium as it falls into the disk and spirals around, or does it actually chemically alter the um, material, potentially making something of some prebiotic type of prebiotic uh, kinds of molecules. Um, and so by comparing the abundances that we see for the very inner disk with those that are seen at larger disk radii and interstellar medium, we found that the abundances differ, so it looks like disks are chemically active. They're not just sitting there, but they're busily making molecules. Another question you could ask is, 
whether disks would be able to preserve those molecules that it's busy creating. Because when the material spirals in from the outer disk and eventually gets to the inner disk and crashes onto the central star, it generates a large amount of ultraviolet radiation. That ultraviolet radiation will shine back on the disk, and because the disk is potentially making planets, so the grains are growing into larger objects, the grain growth reduces the opacity of the disk to UV, to those UV photons, potentially allowing the UV to shine into the disk midplane and destroy all those molecules we would like to see. But it turns out that that's not what happens because the, um, the amount of water that's present in the disk atmosphere is enough to provide really good molecular shielding. So water is a very good, turns out, very good UV opacity source. And so it is able to shield the disk midplane from harsh UV radiation even after grain growth occurs. So this, the combination of these two ideas suggests that disks should be able to make interesting molecules and to preserve them. But today, I wanted to um, use those same set of diagnostics to look at another question uh, about planetesimal formation. So as we were discussing, these planetesimals are hallmarks of the core accretion picture. They're the building blocks of planets, and yet we don't know very much about them. They're basically an observational mystery. Well, it turns out that they're also a theoretical mystery. And there's a really nice annual reviews article that describes how stumped theorists are about how to make a planetesimal. But that's, that's OK. Uh, we shouldn't worry too much, because we still believe in planetesimals, because we, because we have our planetesimal lore to fall back on. So what's our planetesimal lore? They're the building blocks of planets. They're the building blocks of planets, say, in the giant planet region, where they will be icy, like comets. And we're, pre we're pretty sure that planetesimals don't form only in the solar system, but they form around other stars, too, because we see debris disks around many other stars. And the debris is believed to be the result of the collisions of planetesimals that are left over from the planet formation process. So that seems, that seems pretty good. But maybe it's not quite enough. You know, there are other mythological creatures out there that have their own lore, <laughs> like unicorns and <coughs> giant squid. Unicorns are very pure creatures, as anyone with a child knows. Their blood can keep Voldemort alive. <laughs> giant squid have been known to wrestle whales and are believed to sink ships. But there's a big difference, of course, between the unicorns and the giant squid in that giant squid are known to exist. We can see videos of them on the Discovery Channel webpage. So we come to the obvious question of whether planetesimals are more like unicorns or more like giant squid. <laughs> By which I mean not whether planetesimals exist or not, because you know we have the comets, we have the debris there, there are Those things do occur in nature. I think the question for planet, for planet formation is whether planetesimals form early enough and abundantly enough to be the building blocks of planets. So how can we, how can we test that? How do you detect, how do you detect a planetesimal? Uh, it's a kilometer-sized rock. Well, a kilometer is pretty big, but not really that big for astronomical, remote astronomical observations. And uh, they're not self-luminous either, so that also makes it kind of challenging. So there are these kilometer-sized rocks that are the building blocks of planets, so they will be present in a disk that is, still has a lot of gas and dust in them. These treasures are going to be buried in gas and dust. So trying to find them through direct detection is like going to the beach, and you're the only person who forgot to bring your metal detector. <laughs> And not only that, but the beach is 140 parsecs away, so you know you can't go digging around for it. So direct detection is a little challenging. What about trying to look instead for the impact of the planetesimal on its environment? So look, for example, for a dynamical signature. Now, if we were trying to detect a planet, which could do something dramatic like carve a gap, we could look for that. But this is a kilometer-sized object a lot smaller. It's not going to do that. So that's, that's a little difficult. So we have to be a little more creative. 
So what about a, what about a chemical signature? So you might, you might turn to a chemical signature if, um, if you're thinking about the aerodynamics of solids in a disk. So when, um, when the solids are small, they're micron sized, they're extremely well coupled uh, to the gas. So as the gas is spiraling in from the outer disk to the inner disk, the little micron grains are going along with them. <coughs> Great. But when the micron sized grains stick and grow into, say, meter sized objects, then the gas is partially pressure supported, so it rotates a little bit slower than Keplerian, whereas the meter sized objects want to go at Keplerian speed. So they see a big headwind from the gas, which causes them to lose angular momentum and spiral in. So in fact, for meter sized objects, they spiral in pretty quickly relative uh, to the gas. And so because the planetesimals are icy and they're moving in ahead of the gas, this is a way to deliver a lot of water and oxygen to the inner disk and reduce the carbon to oxygen ratio there. Conversely, when the meter sized objects have grown into kilometer sized objects, they are now so big that they don't, the headwind doesn't, doesn't mean anything to them and they just sit on their Keplerian orbits. Which means that they can, since they're in the giant planet region, they can sequester or park a lot of oxygen and water in the outer disk. That means that the material that accretes is deprived of the water and oxygen and will become increasingly carbon rich. So one signature of planetesimal formation could be an increasing carbon to oxygen ratio in the inner disk. Now how strong a signal uh, would that be? So I was looking at that question um, by uh, making some models of what disk atmospheres would look like, uh, so some thermal chemical models of disk atmospheres with Matija Damkovic and um, Al Glasgow at Berkeley. And so these were some of our results. So here is um, the warm column in the disk atmosphere, the amount that could actually produce some emission as a function of the carbon to oxygen ratio for simple molecules like acetylene, HCN, and water. And you can see that as you go to higher carbon to oxygen ratio, the abundance of the simple organics rises and the water abundance falls. Basically because the, the CO grabs all the oxygen and there's very little oxygen for the water and so it, it also goes down. So if you make a ratio of the organics to water, then there's a very sharply rising trend. And so, for example, a two times change in the carbon to oxygen ratio corresponds to something like a 10 times change in the molecular abundance, which is potentially something that we could detect. So this is, a, this is an interesting idea, but how do you make an observation out of this idea? We, we still have to observe something. So we can observe these molecular ratios, but what else can we observe? So uh, in the absence of anyone's prediction, I just thought, well, the dumbest thing, the dumbest thing would be a correlation with disk mass that the more massive a disk, you'd have more planetesimals, which more you know, small grains and meter-sized objects which could collide and grow into planetesimals. So you'd think that a more massive disk would have more planetesimals and therefore would have made a bigger transition in this direction and therefore more organics to water. So I wasn't too optimistic, but uh, I made the plot anyway. So here's... Um, the flux of, of HCN to water as a function of disk mass. And it's actually correlated pretty strongly, which I was very surprised about because there's so many things that can affect these diagnostics that we see. Things like UV and X-ray radiation, grain growth, accretion heating, turbulent mixing, etc. in addition to planetesimal formation. So it's somewhat surprising but it's a very strong correlation. If you try to take the fluxes and abundances of molecules and correlate them with other things, you don't get anything. But here's something that actually, actually looks like a, a very strong correlation. What is it telling us? Well, hmm. um, so I think it's supposed to show that there are three bands here. And, uh, the, what's plotted on the x-axis, what's on the y-axis, and this middle part. So sorry, I don't think the colors came out right. But, so what, is that, what does that plot mean? 
On the x-axis, we have disk mass, and that comes from a submillimeter measurement by uh, Sean Andrews and uh, Jonathan Williams, and um, that's probing the disk at large radii. On the y-axis is the ratio of HCN to water, which is probing what's going on in the disk in the terrestrial planet region over here. But really, both of them are telling us something about this middle region, which is the region we want to know about, the giant planet region. So, so my interpretation of the plot is that in the giant planet region, when you have a disk that is more massive, it creates more planetesimals, which has a bigger impact on the carbon to oxygen ratio in the inner disk. Now, I would like to measure the this mass of this region directly in order to make that connection, but of course I can't, because this is the region that's actually undergone a lot of evolution, so I don't know what it used to be like. However, I could turn to the larger disk radii, which could be, con because it evolves more slowly, could provide a fossil record of what this region of the disk was originally like. So that's why I think there's a relation between those two, but um, it's an interesting topic that could use other great ideas from other people, so I encourage any interested person to think about that. But the, my, my message is that it seems plausible that planetesimal formation could induce a chemical signature in a disk that we could detect. We seem to have some interesting uh, <coughs> evidence of that, that possibility and it's a very simple prediction that it, it affects the carbon to oxygen ratio of the inner disk. So this makes some uh, very simple predictions, I think, for what other uh, correlations one would expect to see. And it would be, since I just wove my hands around to make this interpretation, some real theory about what is the impact of planetesimal formation on the inner disk would be a, a, a good way to test this out further. Okay, so now I wanted to um, uh, turn to uh, what we might learn about a later stage of planet formation, about giant planet formation. Because if we can detect giant planets um, as they're forming, that's a way to get some pretty direct constraints on how that process occurs. So here, we're in, um, better, we're in a better th situation theoretically because we have a uh, number of predictions that have, that are, that have been made. And in um, one of the strongest predictions about what is the impact of giant planets uh, on their surroundings is that they clear a gap. So the idea is that when you have a, plant, a giant planet, it clears a gap in the gas and the dust in the vicinity of its orbit, but gap crossing streams allow accretion to continue. So material from the outer disk um, uh, can accrete onto the planet and also feed an inner disk and subsequent accretion onto the central star. And through that process, the planet can grow in mass until, until perhaps it's about five Jupiter masses, after which accretion could end. <coughs> in both cases, you can see that the planet is clearing out a big chunk in the disk, which would make it optically thin. And so I'm sure you've heard from Catherine Espaillat and um, Sean and others about how people are looking for those signatures in the spectral energy distributions that have been s of young stars that have been studied with Spitzer. So for example, here's um, uh, the spectral energy distribution of a normal star, and it has a star stellar component and a UV axis and a mid-infrared axis. And these so-called transition objects have a deficit of mid-infrared flux, which is interpreted as coming from an optically thin region um, in the disk. So that's a, that, those optically thin regions are indeed a prediction of giant planet formation, but there's a couple of other uh, scenarios that can also produce those optically thin regions. So one is uh, photo evaporation, that the UV radiation shining on the disk could remove most of the inner disk. Another possibility is planetesimal formation, that planetesimals could, in principle, grab all the small dust and make the inner region of the disk optically thin. In this case, it would leave behind all the gas, which could also accrete onto the central star, so that's a different situation. But in principle, either or any of these um, scenarios could explain transition object spectral energy distributions. So basically, we need to turn to get some additional information in order to distinguish among these possibilities. 
And so one possibility is to, instead of just looking for axisymmetric signatures like spectral energy distributions, we can look for non-axisymmetric structure. So what are some of the non-axisymmetric structures we could look for? Of course, there's the planet. And uh, many people have looked for, are, are actively searching for evidence of forming planets. Some other um, non-axisymmetric signatures are the, a circumplanetary disk because when, a, um, when the object forms, if, it's a, if it can cool efficiently, so it's a pretty small object, it does not fill its Roche lobe, that leaves room for a circumplanetary disk that can be fed by these streams. And when the planet is fairly massive, it can also excite an ex eccentricity in the inner rim. And there's no real uh, role for eccentricity in these other scenarios, so that could also be a useful diagnostic. So as I mentioned, while other people are searching for the planet itself, I wanted to illustrate how we could search for some of these other diagnostics using um, gaseous diagnostics. So let me introduce you to this unusual Herbig uh, BE star HD 100 546 for the, for the fans in the audience. It is a 10 million year old star at about 100 parsecs away. Um, it has a large cleared region that's about 10 AU in size. It has a high mass disk and it's accreting at a pretty high rate, 10 to the minus 9 solar masses per year. And so here you can see it has a deficit in its uh, spectral energy distribution that indicates that the dust in the disk is cleared out to about 10 AU. Now one other fact I want to share is that what do we know about the gas distribution here? Basically, we know that there's a, there's a missing amount of gas out to about 13 AU. And we know that from three diagnostics. I'll just go over it briefly because um, that'll come up again. So the three sets of diagnostics are the CO hot bands, so vibrationally excited uh, gas that has a fluorescence component, so it probes a fairly large range of radii. There's the CO 1 to 0 emission, which probes a much smaller range of radii closer to the... Uh, to the inner rim, and OH emission at 3 microns, which also probes close to the inner rim. And one of the easy ways to see that these diagnostics, um, there's a lack of gas close to the star, is just by looking at its line profile. So when we look at the line profile, you can see that it's, it doesn't have much gas at larger velocities. So the gas that would be orbiting close to the central star is missing. So that's a signature of missing gas. And so that helps us to, these simple facts helps us to rule out some of these scenarios fairly quickly. Okay, so it's accreting, so it's not photoevaporation, because photoevaporation generally predicts that it, it, accretion is shut off. We also don't see molecular gas close to the star, so uh, if you think that is consistent with no gas close to the star, then we could rule that scenario out as well. So what else can we learn about this object? Well, one thing that's interesting is that when we look at the CO and the OH line profiles, you notice that the OH looks weird. It's, uh, has a, it's asymmetric and skewed to the blue. And um, that kind of line profile can be produced by an eccentric ring. So if we look at um, a symmetric profile, it would look like this black line. It's nice double peak sort of thing. But as the disk becomes more axis, asym, uh, eccentric, so this, the red line is for an eccentricity of 0.2, um, the, the line profile becomes skewed because, for example, one side of the line, one side of the disk is closer to the central star, so it gets a little hotter, and more emission is produced. And it's also closer, so it, the velocities are higher there, and so the line profile extends further um, in velocity. So if we took the, um, that, that idea and we tried to fit the line profiles we see with an eccentric inner rim, the green, and a more symmetric large disk at larger radii, and we, combined, we allowed both uh, kinds of parts of the disk to contribute to the mission, we could reproduce both the OH and the CO profiles, where most of the OH is coming from the eccentric inner rim and a little bit less for the, for the CO. Okay, so there's, this system has an eccentric inner rim, which might be evidence for a massive planet. If it had an eccentric inner rim, then these um, 
Dynamical calculations suggest that that inner rim would be stationary in the inertial frame. So here's a set of calculations where you, sh where you see that the planet is going around, sometimes it's at the top there at 12 o'clock or 3 o'clock or 9 o'clock, but in each case the eccentric rim is, is at this, has the same shape. So it's approximately stationary. So if, if we're looking at an inner rim in this situation, it wouldn't change in time. And, um, and here's what the, what the hot band emission, CO band emission looks like. So here, here are the lines, and indeed their profiles are not changing very much at all. However, uh, one thing that is changing is the CO1 to 0 emission here. Sometimes it's this black line, sometimes it's the red line, sometimes it's the blue line. And if we difference the red and the blue from the black, then the flux that we see from this, the extra flux that we see for typical disk parameters has an emitting area of 0.1 to 0.2 square AU. What is that? It turns out that for a circumplanetary disk at a distance of 13 AU from a two and a half solar mass star, the size of the a circumplanetary disk would be about 0.5 AU in size. So the area of that disk is just about the emitting area of the, the, this excess that we were just looking at. So now, <coughs> let's suppose that there is a circumplanetary disk there. Uh, this is a size scale of 13 AU, and there's a little disk going around there. And this is at 100 parsecs. So you can see that if we wanted to look for that structure, we would need some pretty good angular resolution. So that's where we uh, could try this technique of spectroastrometry. Um, spectroastrometry is a technique you can use when you have a high resolution spectroscopy uh, with high signal to noise. And it makes use of our ability to centroid to higher accuracy than we can spatially resolve. And it's useful for simple velocity fields. So for example, suppose I have a simple velocity field uh, like a circumstellar disk, and I put the slit on the major axis, and, I'm, and I take one velocity channel, say it's on the blue shifted side of the line, and I look for its spatial centroid, it will be at that end of the slit. If I, look on the, if I take this red velocity channel and I look at the spatial centroid, it will be on this end of the, of the slit, and if I start at zero velocity, I would be having a centroid at the middle of the slit. So, so this idea was um, introduced, the idea that you could use this technique to um, study, uh, was applied to Titori disks first by Klaus Pontapadan, and um, it made a big impact and every, everybody thought it was pretty cool and they wanted to try it out and so of course we did too. So here's our, um, here's our analysis of our data using this method. So if we, here we have the CO hot band lines and the slit is approximately on, along the major axis and you can see that the expected signature is that to the blue you would expect an offset to one side up the slit, the red would be offset down the slit and the zero velocity would be in the middle and that's what we see here. So on the blue side it's offset up the slit, the red is down and the, the zero velocity is in the middle. If we went to an intermediate PA, so we're looking in this direction, it should be roughly the same, it's just that the physical extent is a little less. So we would see the same signature but with smaller offset, and that's what we see there. And if we went to uh, look <coughs> along the minor axis, then we wouldn't expect to see much of a sig signal, and that's what we see as well. So, Spectroastrometry can roughly get the kind of disk shape that we're, we're expecting for these hot band lines. Now for the hot band lines, we're thinking that it's going to be approximately stationary in the inertial frame. So if we observe the same at the same PA over multiple epochs, it should stay the same. So here's some hot band observations taken at three different epochs at the same PA and it's approximately the same. 
But one thing that's not the same is the one to zero emission. So the one to zero emission at the same epochs on the top. And you can see that in 2003, it was doing the same thing. It was offset up the slit at, one, at the blue and down at the red, et cetera, just like the hot band, great. But in 2006, there's a problem. At about 10 kilometers per second, the signal is at zero when it should be further down. And over here, it's worse. It's offset even higher to the blue. So, so first, when we saw this, we thought, ah, our data is just not good enough. But, um, but then we remembered that, you know, there was that thing about the, the flux excess. You know, what, what was that all about? That was like about the size of the circumplanetary disk. Hey, what if you said there was this extra piece of emission that just happened to be at that velocity, but it was like closer to the star, I mean, closer to the middle of the slit so that it pulled the centroid up. Could you affect the spectroastrometric signature, signature like that? So we tried that. And it turned out that you could approximately get things to work if at one epoch where it looked normal, the, there, was, there was no excess. At another epoch, we had um, something that was moving at a particular velocity at close to the slit over there. And at the next epoch, it was moving at a higher, more blue shifted velocity, but higher up the slit in order to, in order to push the spectroastrometric signature up. So when you add that extra component in, um, our original fit is up there, and you can see that it actually improves it quite a bit. So this lack of, uh, this is pushed up higher here, and um, uh, it explains why the, this region isn't dipping down quite as much. <coughs> so. There's this excess emitting region that, or, that and it turns out that the position and velocity that we need in order to fit that is consistent with orbital motion, uh, Keplerian motion, at 13 AU from the, at the mass of that star. Now that just seemed very kind of coincidental, but um, it turned out that at one of the epochs that we had observed in 2006, another group, had done some polarimetric imaging at about the same epoch. And what they found was, uh, so this is a paper by Quantz et al. And so what they found is after they subtract off the star, this is the polarized emission that they see. So it's roughly axisymmetric, but there's like sort of a missing piece of flux right there, which they interpret as being the, it's polarized, so scattered light, as being sort of missing flux, perhaps by obscured by an intervening planet. So it turned out that the PA of this missing flux was the same as the PA that we inferred for the mystery object at the same epoch. So if we superpose these two observations, then the uh, grayscale in the back is the Quans thing. And you see that the missing flux is the red circle. Our object position is just inside of it. And so since the quantum thing, the missing flux is missing scattered light, which presumably is missing light from the star, <clears throat> the object that we infer could be just inside to shadow the disk and prevent light from scattering <coughs> off the disk. Hmm, interesting. So there's this, our CO excess emission sort of agrees with this scattered light result. Um, what else could we do to see whether that really holds up? Well, we could make another observation. So if, uh, so our picture is that the um, lines that trace the inner rim and the region of the disk, that is gonna stay steady in the inertial frame, but that this extra source would keep moving around. It would move further to the blue and further down the slit. So um, that's the prediction. Uh, let's see what happened. So um, earlier this year, um, my collaborators, uh, John Carr and uh, Sean Britton, uh, went observing at the VLT, and uh, this is what happened. So we, our prediction was that the OH emission would 
have retained the same profile because it's stationary in the inertial frame, and it did. We predicted that the CO hot band emission, which has, has a greater contribution from the larger disk, so it's more symmetric, would nevertheless stay the same, and, and it did. We predicted that the CO1 to 0 emission would not stay the same, and it, it did vary, and that it would become blue shifted, and yes, it did. So it was red shifted before, it became more blue shifted. And we also predicted that the spectroastrometric signature would signal would move up higher in the slit because the um, object has gone from gone in that direction, and, uh, and the signature is actually more extended. So basically, in 2003, uh, the object was behind the inner rim, so we didn't see it. In 2006, it moved to a velocity of 6 kilometers per second, and it was centered in the slit, which is why at the, it's sort of missing the spectroastrometric signature doesn't go all the way down right here in, in the 2006 epoch. But in 2010, it, was, it shifted to about zero velocity and further up the slit, which is why at zero velocity it's pushed up. And now it's gone to minus six kilometers per second and further down the slit, so the spectroastrometric signature has, has moved further up. So, So um, it's possible that this system harbors a massive giant planet surrounded by a circumplanetary disk that excites an eccentric inner rim. And um, if that's the case, what, is, what does that actually tell us about planet formation? Well, um, this would be a system in which there's a gap in both the gas and the dust, which is a prediction from theory. Um, if there is a circumplanetary disk here, that means that the planet that it surrounds is a small planet, so it's, it cools efficiently. It doesn't, doesn't fill its Roche lobe, um, and uh, so planets can start out being pretty, pretty small. And uh, if the system has an eccentric rim, that might have something, that might be telling us something about how planets, uh, how you can form high mass planets. So before, I just wanted to spend just the last few minutes um, talking about that. So how, how do planets um, get their masses? In the, in the 1980s, the end of the 80s, um, we all, of course, that's when we only knew of Jupiter. And so when, when theorists looked at this problem and they saw that they could open a gap when uh, the planet had about a Jupiter mass, that seemed to be a good answer as to how, how, how planets get their masses. The gap opens and that's the end of accretion. But in the 90s, people found that <coughs> streams could allow, um, streams, gra crossing streams would allow accretion to continue beyond that to higher masses, potentially up to five Jupiter masses. And that was a good thing because if we look at the history of planet masses as a function of discovery date, over that interval we discovered more planets of higher masses, and so that was a good way to understand why their planets have yet higher masses. But if we look at the, if we look at the planet masses known today, there are of course many more that are much higher masses. And so if, if five Jupiter masses really is the limit for this kind of accretion situation, then we might have to um, turn to another pathway to, to make these large ma higher mass planets, maybe something like gravitational instability or something like that. Or perhaps there's more physics that we could add to um, continue this um, method of accretion. So here's where the eccentric rims might come in. Because um, when, when planets form, uh, they can, if they excite eccentric rims, that can increase the, the accretion rate onto the planet. So here's some results from Clay and Dirksen, and um, they plotted here accretion rate as a function of planet mass, going from one Jupiter mass up to about five Jupiter masses here, and then to larger masses. And so as you can see, 
they found that at first the accretion rate tapers off in the same way that other people had found that lim suggesting that, that five Jupiter masses was a limit for accretion streams. But after, you can also see that at larger masses, the accretion rate jumped up. And the reason for that is that at, at that point, the disk became much more eccentric. And if you unwrap the, if you unwrap the, um, their simulation here and plot this as a function of azimuthal angle, the planet here, is, you can see that the planet is moving along here. And periodically, it encounters a region of very high density which allows a much higher accretion rate onto the planet. And when you azimuthally average that up, you can really boost the accretion rate, allowing for renewed accretion and extension potentially to higher masses. So this would be a, a way in which you could prolong accretion and, and grow much more massive planets. So um, perhaps looking, finding evidence of eccentric rims helps to support that idea. So um, just to summarize then, um, uh, we were discussing two general topics about planet, planet formation, an early phase of planet formation and a late phase. So for the early phase about planetesimals, I, was, I mentioned how planetesimals are such an important part of core accretion theory that's kind of like what makes, makes it different. Um, and yet we don't really have that much evidence that that really happens. Uh, so I suggested that it might be possible to look for that phase of evolution by looking for the chemical signature of the presence of planetesimals. And um, there's some interesting developments along those lines. Uh, for the, in terms of later um, planet formation, we were talking about giant planet formation and how it might be possible to use non-axisymmetric uh, signatures of giant planets as a way to look for their presence. Those non-axisymmetric signatures are, of course, the planet itself, the circumplanetary disk, and potentially these eccentric inner rims, not only would these um, diagnostics point out systems that might actually be forming giant planets, but it might give us some interesting direct clues to how um, the origin of, of high mass planets. Uh, so thanks so much for your attention and your patience. Thank you for a very clear Talk, John. It was an excellent talk. So um, the floor is open for questions. So uh, what keeps giant planet formation from going all the way to making some kind of oddball M dwarf <coughs> star that has been made by the planet formation process? Um, I don't know what would would keep it from doing that. I suppose there might be some limit to how much it could accrete in this way that we were just describing, or perhaps that there would be a more efficient way to make such a system through uh, a more of a gravitational instability kind of situation or a binary, a traditional binary vision type, not vision, but mechanisms. So um, I don't know. I don't know what is the upper limit to uh, this kind of situation. But it'll be an interesting thing to investigate theoretically and then um, uh, to, to look for it observationally. So for example, um, let's say that someone can uh, locate using, you know, I only use some pretty bad uh, data taken with a 30-year-old spectrograph to make those uh, observations. Somebody with using uh, good angular, high angular resolution AO observations might actually be able to learn more about an orbiting object there get its characteristics and we could learn what mass it is. Maybe it will turn out to be a higher mass um, you know, <coughs> brown dwarf or something like that. But uh, that's just uh, you know, an observational method. So, so when we have really high resolution spectral polarimeters that can make these cubes of polarized light, can you combine the differential polarization maps and the spectroscopy at the same time? Can you can you describe what you mean by you, you had you had the PDI images yes and then you had spectra of the same objects right right so what if you could have polarization spectroscopy and imaging all at the same time for the same object from the same instrument which I understand someone is building for the PLC um, yeah I'm sure that is I'm sure that would be wonderful I'm just thinking uh, exactly what what I would do with it. Um, what wavelength is this going to work at? 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> That's perfect. It's the same people as you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things one can do, right? If you, if you know what, um, you can recover what light was scattered or not scattered by some object you are learning about its composition. So um, that, would, that would be fantastic. I was only showing what is happening at the very surface of that circumplanetary disk that it has some hot CO there. But I think people would like to know when, what else is there, what kind of mineralogy does it have, et cetera, and about the, the central object itself as well. So, yeah, sure. You know? Yeah. Oh, no, it's a jump. Uh, so, what, are there any constraints you can put on the mass of the companion based on the uh, eccentricity of the, of the inner disk or that, of that disk? Well, when you look at um, the results from Clay and Dirksen, for example, you know those kinds of simulations, they all, there's so many parameters that go into um, the, the simulation. So it would depend on exactly how you decided to, you know, what, what alpha you chose and whether it was turbulent or not. But if you just go with the, their, their assumptions, then um, you would end up with the, that kind of eccentric rim with high accretion above five Jupiter masses. Mm -hmm. And how high it would go, um, they didn't really specify in their paper, so. <coughs> um, it, you had the two, com for the planetesimals, you had the two competing processes for the small rocks and the bigger rocks. So the fact that you don't see the dragging in of the oxygen yes. from the small rocks, does that put a limit on the lifetime that they spend, the amount of time they spend as small rocks, <coughs> because they grow very quickly to planet as small? Thank you, Martin, for embracing my idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, Martin's pointing out how um, I was mentioning what would happen if everything made a planetesimal. What is the, what is the chemical implication for the inner disk that it would be more carbon rich? But if, if we went to an earlier phase of evolution where it was the meter-sized objects, then those, of course, dump more oxygen into the inner disk and everything would be more oxygen rich. So you could imagine if we accept that, say, the, the Taurus T Taurus stars I was showing are in this later phase. If I went to an even earlier phase of evolution, I might be able to see a, tri a, a situation where things with higher disk masses had higher oxygen you know, abundance. Um, so that's, and yes, if you could, if we could find those systems and date them, then yes, I think we could say, you know, whether, I mean, does that, I'm not sure there is, ever is a situation where that is the dominant thing, because perhaps you never grow only meter-sized objects, you just rapidly transition to yeah. kilometer-sized objects. So that's something that could be addressed observationally. If you accept the this picture, then you could look for things that are younger and see whether there's any evidence for um, an anti-correlation with this mass. In the system with the potentially orbiting disk, um, I think you said that there was, uh, there was no gas in the interior, but you also said that it was accreting. So could you reconcile those? Is yes. Scale? So I don't see any molecular gas, um, CO or OH, um, within 13 AU. And that's a pretty, for the CO, that's a pretty tight limit because it's through fluorescence. So since it's fluorescence, um, if there was any cold gas that wouldn't emit easily, you'd still detect it through fluorescence and, and we can rule that out. So down to pretty um, stringent limits, there's no molecular gas in the inner disk. Now, if you can continue the accretion through streams, then that's a way to funnel a lot of um, gas into the inner disk and star and not take up a lot of real estate with the gas. So potentially that is what is going on, although I think it's a completely open question. Yeah. You argue that in the earliest stages of planetesimal formation, the planetesimals will have this migration pattern that will enhance the organics and you expect more of that to be happening in the more massive disks right. because there would be more planetesimals there. But do you expect that there would be any pre-existing difference between more massive and less massive disks, disks in terms of the organic spectrum? Because you might wonder if the more massive disks <coughs> would have, in general, more organics closer in, because maybe their potential is deeper so they can hold those inwards. Or very naive question. Or less because of the higher radiation. Mm. Um, or, or less, just because of the higher radiation field in the more massive star. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, 
Uh, great, great ideas. Um, so on the higher mass star, for this population, they're all Taurus, T-Taurus stars with a very narrow range of spectral types. So that part of it is not so important. Uh, the, the, but on the other hand, the UV radiation is uh, more affected by the accretion rate. Um, so we didn't find any strong trend of the ratio with accretion rate, although accretion rate does affect other diagnostics. Whether it would hold in a more primordial um, abundance, the chemical modeling of disk atmospheres um, generally shows that the chemical time is very short. So uh, whatever the initial abundance was typically would be wiped away through the uh, um, on a short chemical time, much less than the dynamical time. So um, one would think that the, the primordial abundance doesn't have that much of a role there. It's my current answer. One last question in the back. In this uh, disk with inner holes where you probably accrete through streams, what would you need to see those streams? I mean, you said there's no CO gas. But yes. how, what, what would you need to see the stuff which is flowing in well, between that, if it exists? But if the, if the streams have dust in them, then perhaps Alyssa's magical instrument could detect... Oh, sphere. <laughs> sphere. Yes, I've heard of that. Perhaps Sphere will be able to detect um, some streams. And I think uh, there's, there's a, there's a, there's an ALMA observation where they claim to detect streams or something like that uh, in millimeter gas at, for some object at much larger radii. So it's a, it's a related thing to that. But for something really close in where you need very high angular resolution, um, potentially that would be something. Or maybe um, if, you if you wanted to look for the gas and you had a lot of sensitivity, I think you could use like an IFU uh, and look for gas emission at certain, um, you know, chop it up, look for yeah, gas flows. Well, let's thank Joan again for a really like excellent.